Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this lecture uh, entitled Perspectives on Causality. My name is Jan van der Band, and this lecture is part of the uh, Biomedical Science Master's course on Causal Inference in Observational Research. Um, this is going to be a lecture which is a little bit more aimed to give you a um, broad perspective on causality. It's going to be a, be a little bit uh, philosophic, but uh, we hope to give you also some um, ways to think about causality which are going to be useful in your further studies. So before we talk about uh, models of causality, we need to cover a little bit of terminology and also some items such as uh, necessity and sufficiency and what these mean. After that we're going to cover a little bit of uh, philosophy of science and uh, the, the philosophy of knowledge and how we uh, as humans uh, can obtain knowledge if at all. And finally, we will cover some causal models uh, often used in medicine. The learning goals for this lecture uh, are described over here. Um, basically, uh, it's important that you really understand these concepts of necessity and sufficiency in causal reasoning and causal inference. Um, you will come away with this lecture with some general definitions for causality from which you may uh, be able to inform your own working definition of causality. And finally, you know some general models of causality uh, and some specific to medicine. First, a little bit of terminology. Uh, the first uh, one is a tautology. Um, this is a set of propositions that is necessarily true. For instance, uh, the sky is blue or the sky is not blue. This combination of, of propositions always covers every possible instance. So. Uh, during the day the sky is blue, during the night the sky is black. These are both, both covered by these set of propositions and therefore they are necessarily true. A contradiction is, on the other hand, is a set of propositions that is necessarily false. So I would say uh, the sky is blue and the sky is not blue. Um, this is not, this is false. The, the sky cannot be blue and not blue at the same time. So that's a contradiction. Um, then we have uh, a slightly less stringent uh, term and that's a possibility so these are a set of propositions that are true or could have been true given a set of circumstances so it's more of a conditional statement during the day the sky is blue or during the night the sky is black um, closely related to possibilities we have a uh, continu contiguity um, that is a set of prop uh, propositions that is not necessarily true or necessarily false, so they're not tautologies, not contradictions, but they are possible. Uh, contiguity in the philosophical sense also means that um, things are closely related in either space or time, and this is uh, important also in the definitions of causality. Um, another uh, term is an axiom, which is a premise that is taken to be true and usually serves as a starting point in reasoning. And finally, um, this is uh, going to be important a little bit later on in the lecture, uh, a conjecture, which is a conclusion or a proposition that is based on incomplete information for which no proof has been found yet. Now, now that we've covered these terms, we can uh, dive into the nitty gritty. And that is uh, the concept of necessity and sufficiency. So starting at the top, uh, here we have A is equivalent to B, or B if and only if A, which is um, indicated by this double-headed arrow. Um, B if and only if A means that uh, A is a necessary and sufficient cause for B. So B can occur only if A is there. So the light in this case comes on only if this light switch is flipped to on position. And if the light switch is switched to the off position, B has to the light has to be off. This means that the light switch is a necessary and sufficient cause for the light bulb to become on. Uh, in the second case, A implies B means that A is a sufficient cause for B, but not a necessary cause. So if this light switch is switched to on, then the light becomes on. Let's say if there wasn't a second light switch, then B would also be on. So if A is switched to on, B is on, but B can also, the light switch can also be, uh, the light bulb can also be on if another light switch, uh, light bulb is switched. And finally, 
uh, B implies A means that A is a necessary cause. So if the light switch is so if the light is on, then the light switch has also has to be on. Um, it's not a sufficient cause. Say if there were uh, two light switches in sequence, uh, rather than parallel, as in the previous example, then both light switches would have to be switched on for B to be on. If B is on, then it would imply that both light switches are on. So necessary and sufficient sufficient and necessary. Now that we've covered a little bit of the uh, of the important terms that you need to know and need to understand uh, to move on uh, to move on into more a philosophical debate, we're going to talk a little bit about classical empiricism. This is basically uh, what classical empiricism says that if uh, the all knowledge that is gained, if at all, if we can gain knowledge at all, it's gained through observation. And this is a classical example of the empirical cycle. Starting from an observation, so we note that some patients may have a different response to a therapy, uh, or some patients uh, uh, die despite therapy, then we induce from those observations a model or a theory. We say that these patients, the therapy may not be effective for some reason. For instance, they have a different enzyme in the liver, uh, metabolizing the drug differently. From that theory, we can make some predictions through induction. We can say that if these patients have this enzyme, then they will uh, respond less. So if we then test and measure the enzyme beforehand, we can say that if patients have this certain enzyme, then they will in all likelihood not respond to therapy. We do the tests and we collect the data and we evaluate uh, does the data um, is the data according to our expectations if not why not if so what does this mean and we go back to the observation and induction and by completing this cycle over and over we gain knowledge we learn about uh, the therapeutic effect of a certain drug for us, for instance Now, closely related to classical empiricism, or actually a more um, advanced view of it, is the logical positivism, which is really founded by, uh, by Hume and later uh, John Locke, which basically is saying Hume was, goes farther than the uh, classical empiricism, and he basically says anything that is thought of, any idea, is anal uh, analytic and can be verified by reasoning, by thinking about it. However, anything that is uh, observed, the concrete, um, um, is sen uh, synthetic, so uh, and can only be uh, verified by um, observing it structurally. And he says basically all truths must be verifiable, so either through reasoning or through uh, observation, and to be meaningful. Later on, um, Hume said that verification is is going to be almost impossible. Um, because you can never be uh, completely certain that something is the case and you can confirm what you thought repeatedly and repeatedly. And the more something is confirmed, the closer you ap uh, approach verification. And in that sense, uh, probabilities are seen as a grade of confirmation. So, um, uh, and that is something, that's something that we use also in, in um, implicitly in statistical uh, analyses, where a very low p-value is seen as a often as a high grade of confirmation. And according to the logical positivists, the goal of science is to explain what we see, uh, for instance through the deductive nomological model. And basically what this model does is say, uh, given uh, a certain set of causes or um, observations, and we apply to that set of causes, a set of natural laws, then we can unequivocally predict a set of effects. Um, and this basically means that there is a single inalienable truth that holds for everyone, everywhere, and thereby all science in the end comes down to fundamental physics. And the log logical positive view is obviously a, a popular uh, way to look at science for physicists. Uh, there is a 
physicists are still looking for a, a universal law of physics that applies to everyone, that applies everywhere, and uh, describes reality in its, in its completeness, and describes our universe in its completeness. Um, so if you know all these laws, then basically you can predict anything, you can explain anything. And, so, and uh, physics, physics is looking for these laws all the time. Um, now, Hume, more specifically on causality, says that uh, C is a cause of E if and only if, remember, the necessary and sufficient. So C causes E if and only if C is precedent to E on a specific occasion, which means that C occurs before E on a specific occasion. It's temporarily contiguous, remember contiguity, so it's close some in some sense to E on a specific occasion. And that um, those things which uh, look like C uh, are always present and temporarily contiguous to instances of E. Meaning that basically um, um, the exact same events do not occur more than once, right? Because time moves forward. But something which looks like something that you occurred that occurred in the past um, should always result in something resembling the effect. So basically turning on the light switch uh, now and turning on the light switch 10 minutes from now should in all cases result in a light bulb coming on. Um, however, we have a little problem here and that is through these uh, within these um, um, these criteria is that neither the cause, the effect, or the causal mechanism itself have to be perceived. Um, why is this a problem? Well, when you think about it, then there can be su such a thing as completely hidden causes. Some, so we do not see the effect cause, we do not see the effect, and we do not see the causal mechanism. This is something which occurs completely outside of our observable universe. And such things are not verifiable, they're not confirmable, and they are not uh, falsifiable. And therefore, in according to the empiricist uh, point of view, it is not uh, knowledge. Um, it, it, it may be common practice, but it's not knowledge. Um, thus, uh, Hume uh, chose to amend this definition, or the previous definition, uh, by uh, uh, making the third criterion that uh, the, the, the cause precedes the effect and that the cause is uh, in time close to the effect um, with the 3a which basically says the idea of the cause determines the mind to form the idea of the effect so that at least you can think of it and the impression which is closely related but that's um, um, the observation in, in the sense uh, the observation the way and in the way we uh, what what we do in our minds with the observation determines the mind to form the idea of the effect and this rules out the possibility of hidden cause at least in a philosophical sense as they can at least be thought of and form a potential effect and this is something important to note so you don't actually have to observe the cause and observe the effect as long as you can think of a potential cause and think of the potential effect then all of a sudden it becomes at least logically verifiable because it's formed as an idea and it, uh, and those ideas as Hume said previous uh, as we discussed before need to be able to be verified logically within our minds so to sum up um, C causes E if and only if, so it's a necessary and sufficient cause. Uh, if C precedes E, if it's uh, close in time to E, and if uh, at the very least our thought of C can uh, form a potential outcome E. And the impression basically says the same thing in a uh, slightly uh, different way for our intents and purposes. Um, evidence for causality is roughly uh, gathered by finding uh, continuous or, or uh, over and over again associations between C and E. That way we confirm that there may be a, a causal relationship 
and it provides a useful causal interpretation. Note, however, that Hume says we cannot ever directly observe a causal relationship. We can only see that C, that the cause and effect are um, re apparently related. We cannot perceive the causal mechanism directly. We can only uh, confirm by association. This is captured by a relevant CKD, uh, uh, XKCD. Um, there is always a relevant XKCD. Um, in this case, uh, the protagonist uh, took a uh, statistics class and now realizes that uh, correlation is not causation. But correlation may not imply causation. It's just a very, very, very strong hint. Now, we had the world nicely covered, logical positivists were working on uh, a universal law of physics, and then came along Einstein. And what Einstein's uh, special and later general relativity theory uh, roughly implied is that A, the laws of physics are the same for each and every observer, um, so the laws of physics hold everywhere in the universe, um, however, the observed phenomenon also depends on the observer. Um, and he's, he's saying basically no observer is more true than the other. Um, what this means, for instance, if you're driving uh, a car down the highway um, and you see another car close by, that car moving to you, relative to you is moving at a fairly slow speed. However, if there was someone standing by the road, you would be racing by with 120 kilometers an hour. That person by the, the, uh, by the side of the road would say, you are racing uh, by me uh, 120 kilometers per hour. Whereas if you're in the car, you could also say that person ra is racing by me with 120 kilometers an hour. Whereas the car next to me is almost standing still. And these are all true. It's relative. It's relative to the observer what the motion or direction of the other uh, of the other uh, phenomenon is, and um, basically what this meant and what this implies is there is there is no longer one universal inalienable truth, right? The truth or a truth depends on who's looking at it. Um, in that sense, Einstein made a made made a democracy out of physics. Um, and it was a, a huge revolution uh, at the time in science. Um, for a, a no few nice uh, examples, for instance, about the, the observer effect, uh, there is uh, the effect of time dilation. Uh, uh, there's a nice video uh, by, by Robert Dijkgraaf uh, in the DVD University. I will put it in the link below. If you have some time, please look at it because it's a very uh, strong example of, of time dilation. Basically, that the the passing of time depends on uh, whether you're moving or not. So, from the perspective of Robert Dijkgraaf, uh, um, time is moving more slowly than from the perspective of the observer in the room, um, which is really a, a cool example. And this is a second example of uh, of um, um, physics. Uh, um, uh, according to Einstein, and this is uh, an important example because uh, Einstein's theory, theory of, uh, of general relativity was, uh, was very uh, exact in a sense that it uh, gave some predictions which were very easily to test. Um, for instance, Einstein predicted that light, uh, even though it has no mass, is still affected by gravity, which is something that could not occur according to Newtonian physics. Newton said basically uh, op uh, objects with mass attract each other. Light has no mass, so it shouldn't be affected by gravity. And Einstein predicted, yes, light should be a, a, uh, affected uh, by gravity, uh, which is easily testable, right? Well, fairly easily. Here we see the test. In the center of this, uh, of this uh, picture, we see two very bright stars, quasars. And actually, these two very similar, very bright stars are not two stars, they're one star. There's one quasar, uh, on the other side of this galaxy over here, and the, the gravity of the galaxy causes the light to lens, to bend on one 
uh, way around the galaxy and the other way around the galaxy and that's why we see two quasars. So the light of this quasar is bent around this galaxy. So light, even though it has no mass, does, uh, is affected by gravity, which uh, uh, if, not, uh, if it had not occurred would have refuted Einstein's theory and now it's uh, some, some sort of um, uh, evidence towards Einstein's theory. So, to sum up, um, um, Einstein uh, and physics, uh, physics and Einstein in particular, brought forward theories that were very easily testable and therefore potentially refutable. And this was a huge inspiration to Karl Popper. Uh, Karl Popper, he's a, 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 an important philosopher of science, uh, one of the most important in the 20th century, and he was really inspired by Einstein, by Einstein's um, encouragement uh, towards others to uh, to go ahead and, and try to refute his theory. Einstein encouraged him. Einstein uh, uh, was looking forward to being proven wrong. Whereas um, uh, other, uh, in other fields of science uh, at the time, uh, particularly psychology, and uh, Popper had worked in, uh, in Adler's la uh, lab or had been mentored by Adler uh, in, in, during his young years, um, an art of topology, for instance, uh, is a theory which is not testable, not even in principle. So any criticism of a, a psychological theory is easily refuted, right? If you can't test it, then, then anything can be used to confirm your theory. Which led uh, Popper to believe that not confirmation, so uh, looking for uh, or reasoning towards your theory, but falsification should be the goal of science. So if we take a theory, we should try and prove it wrong. And that any theory which is not in, at least in, uh, in principle falsifiable is not a good scientific theory. And obviously this is, is completely at odds with the logical positive view, uh, positivist view, which says basically what you want to do is verify or at least confirm. Um, and uh, one of the, the important problems in, in uh, logi uh, logical positivism is the problem of induction. So uh, induction basically means if, you, uh, if a series of observations is made, then a new claim is made based upon these uh, observations. However, regardless of the number of observations, absolute certainty cannot be claimed uh, from predictions. Um, um, results from the past do not guarantee the future. That's something you hear in every stock exchange uh, adver advertisement. So even though the past can be used to predict the future, you can never achieve full certainty. Um, and uh, the, the induction also requires that uh, the future indeed can be predicted from the past. Um, and the question, according to logical positivism, is uh, and which, which Popper thought was wrong, is how to justify that which cannot be justified by uh, induction. Popper says we shouldn't even be trying to justify, we shouldn't even be trying to confirm. No, all knowledge and thus causal reasoning is created through a conjecture. So um, um, an idea, remember from the first slide, uh, a conclusion, a foregone conclusion that is not uh, yet uh, um, corroborated by any evidence. So we take this conjecture, we say this is true, and then we start criticizing it. And from the conjecture and saying, uh, um, for instance, uh, light is affected by gravity, we can criticize this. Okay, if I believe that light is not affected by gravity, then I need to find some strong source of, of some strong uh, source of gravity and try and see if light is affected by it. And uh, indeed, even in Einstein's days, uh, there was an experiment uh, during a solar eclipse where uh, scientists on two, uh, uh, in, uh, looked uh, at the uh, star sign Taurus and saw that the relative position of the stars uh, in the star sign um, was, was different uh, from uh, what can be seen usually at night when the star sign, or uh, six months later when the star sign was visible during the night. Um, because the light of these stars was bent around the sun. Normally you can't see it, but during a solar eclipse, they were able to see the stars. So that um, verified Einstein's theory. So Einstein basically said, this is true, light is affected by gravity, 
you guys can go ahead and criticize if you want, show me the evidence. An important um, tool to say in, in, uh, in falsificationism um, is Occam's razor. And Occam's razor is basically saying uh, among competing hypotheses, the one of the fewest assumptions is the one that should be favored. Um, from a mathematical point of view, Occam was a, 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 a vicar uh, a, and also a mathematician in the 13th century. And from a mathematical view, um, you can say basically any assumption is prone to error. You uh, have some random noise, some measurement error or something like that. And if this assumption does not improve the accuracy of theory, then this error only increases the probability that the overall theory is wrong. Therefore, a simpler theory with fewer assumptions is preferred. From a falsificationist view, uh, this also holds because a simpler theory uh, um, has greater empirical content. And this is uh, uh, made uh, objective by the fact that uh, uh, a simpler theory is in general uh, is, is more generalizable it holds in more instances and uh, because it's more generalizable there are more examples where you can test it so a simpler theory is easily is more easily tested so if you think about uh, causality in a falsificationist view and this is what what popper basically said science should do um, is that a causal model and the causal model that you are going to be created should be as simple as can be for which all the components and at least their products uh, or at least their products are measurable or in principle or uh, in some way uh, uh, there uh, if the products are measurable if you cannot uh, measure the, the, the component itself make sure that you can measure the product and for which the individual parts of the causal model are testable so implications within the model within the theory as a whole uh, subparts have to be testable and the model as a whole obviously has to be testable okay so here i'm going to stop with the uh the general lecture on philosophy there are some more modern theories uh, about uh, in the philosophy of science but um i chose to to stop at popper because he is really the last uh, philosopher of science who is telling how science should be, how uh, from a, a uh, uh, the theological point of view. So, so where should we go? Uh, more modern philosophers of science, um, they they tend to be more descriptive. Uh, basically, uh, after Einstein and after Popper, everybody was like, we don't even know what science is doing. So, we don't have the guts to tell scientists what they should be doing. Uh, I, th I think it's it's uh, Popper had some some real guts in saying uh, no the way we're looking at science is wrong and this is what science should be doing. In the end, he may not be completely right. Some verification or confirmation is still required. Still, I think uh, falsification is very closely related to to uh, medical research in the sense that uh, in all statistics we aim to falsify some uh, hypothesis. So Popper is really important to our field. Okay, moving on. Causality in medicine. You may have heard already of the uh, Bradford Hill criteria. Um, in fact, uh, the Bradford Hill criteria are, are uh, devised by Sir uh, Austin Bradford Hill, and uh, he uh, presented them in a lecture which is was later um, um, published in the Proceedings of the Royal Academy of Science in already uh, uh, almost 50 years ago. And he posited uh, nine potential ways to look at causality. He never intended them to be criteria, but later on people took them as such. Um, these are the nine criteria that, li that are listed over here. Uh, the strength of the association, consistency, specific specificity of the, of the association, temporality, so the cause precedes the effect, biological gradient, a, a dose-response relationship basically, whether it's plausible, uh, given the knowledge that we already have, a coherence um, with uh, current knowledge, uh, experiment, which he judged as to be one of the strongest, and analogy. Well, uh, in the assignment later on, uh, you are going to be over going over the, the Bradford Hill criteria, so I'm not going to go very deep into this, um, but I think it's important that you at least know uh, of the Bradford Hill criteria, because they do uh, tend to 
come up every now and then uh, when talking about uh, causal effects in medicine. Uh, uh, another model, which for epidemiologists is very important, is a Rothman's component uh, cause model. Um, already devised uh, quite some time ago, um, uh, Rothman basically says that uh, in, in medicine we tend not to have just one necessary and sufficient cause. Uh, human biology is complex and um, a sufficient cause often is made up out of uh, several components. So here we have three sufficient causes for a certain disease and looking at the components you see here components a b c d e uh, here a b are still present c d and e are not present and here only a is present so looking at three these three component causes we can say a appears to be a necessary cause but it's not sufficient it needs some other um, aspects some other component causes to form a sufficient cause And from the uh, compo uh, sufficient cause model, uh, um, Rothman is also uh, able to explain something such as uh, a biological uh, interaction or effect modification, um, where basically in uh, the instances uh, here, um, the U means that this is an unmeasured uh, sufficient cause. So here there's basically, you get uh, the disease, we don't know why. Um, here we have uh, X yeah, being 1 being the sufficient cause, here with Z being 1 being the sufficient cause, and so on. And here in this case, the, the f last four, this should be an H, the last four examples are effect modifications. So basically having both X and Z uh, forms a sufficient cause. Um, an example could be uh, what's called uh, phenylketourea, where uh, having both a genetic defect in an enzyme which uh, converts phenylalanine uh, to alanine as well as having phenylalanine in uh, diet um, uh, causes mental retardation in, in children. Uh, this is a, a, a genetic defect which uh, is screened for um, uh, shortly after birth and um, by just removing phenylalanine from the diet then this uh, sufficient cause is, uh, is, is taken away and uh, the mental retardation is uh, prevented which is really a classical and very strong example of effect modification and the sufficient cause model uh, being valuable in this case by uh, preventing disease in these children so rounding up um, you're now going to go into uh, a self-study assignment um, um, uh, you, I want you to, uh, to create a proof table this is to practice uh, necessary and sufficiency uh, um, uh, look a little bit into the Bradford and Hill criteria because the article by Bradford and Hill is really really good um, he's basically uh, summing up and giving advice that after 50 years later still holds and is still very much true um, and finally, um, the potential outcomes framework is something that you may come across in the next few weeks and it's also something that's used in epidemiology and uh, compare this with the sufficient uh, cause model. Um, if you have any lectures or any questions about this lecture then uh, please leave, uh, leave the questions in the comments below and I'll try to, to answer them um, as soon as I, uh, I have the time. Or, and, and, um, thank you for your attention. And, uh, Hopefully see you uh, next time.